macro trends are interesting to you as of right now, or do you really take it on a deal by deal basis? Yeah, I mean, we take it very much on a deal by deal basis. We are an industry agnostic program. This year, we had 951 applications from 49 states and 42 countries. It's the, the breadth of deals that we see is pretty extensive. And we try to have a point of view on a lot of different industries. But we also need to recognize where we can provide outsized value. And that's not necessarily across all industries. This, we saw a lot of AI companies. We didn't actually invest in any kind of pure AI companies. We actually considered a few very, very strongly. Ultimately, they, they didn't make it through. We'll invest in anything, you know, CPG, digital health, advanced manufacturing. And we'll consider hardware, software, you know, enterprise consumer. And so, yeah, I think AI will continue to be a very interesting space that we'll, we'll, we'll monitor and look at. I think there's going to be, there's a lot of things to monitor and it'll be, be an exciting year for sure. Well done. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Elijah. You've seen a lot of different startups and deal flow and all different sides and types and flavors. What would you say makes a good startup? Man, it's a loaded question. I know we've got <laughs> what, an hour for this call. Uh, that's a good one to jump on into. Just that call if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's a great question. I think it's it's hard to maybe kind of pin down specifics. I think what to us and to, you know, us as a 43 North team, but but myself personally, I think that kind of the two big things that matter to us are the founding team, right? The composition of that founding team, um, kind of the unique traits and DNA of the founders that they're really equipped to, um, you know, move, move things in in kind of the direction of um let me back up you know starting a company is swimming upstream and there is a lot of friction that comes with that and so you know having that grittiness as a founder i think is super important i think it is a an absolute i think it's table stakes for for a successful startup uh, so a great founding team and, and you know, a, a large uh, and or emerging market, right? So having tailwinds, um, you know, there's a, a great quote. Um, I think it's like a Warren Buffett quote that, you know, great teams um, operating in bad markets, the market's always going to win. Uh, so it doesn't really even matter the team. It's it, And it's not so much like, you know, team first market second, I think it's kind of like 1A and 1B, right? You've got to have a great team, but you've got to be fundamentally operating in, in a space, in a market that is going to be conducive for your success uh, because timing may not work out, right? Like there's 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 luck that plays a role. Uh, you could be, you could have the best idea, um, but be a few, a few years early. I think that was kind of like web van, um, you know, being a little bit too early, that was you know, and of course, similar... I don't even know who that is, which clearly shows like yeah. they didn't they didn't get the timing right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Webvan that was one of those early dot com companies that like burned through eight hundred million dollars of cash. But they their vision was pretty much what uh, what Amazon is today. Um, but they were they were too early. It was almost too ambitious for the time. So I think you know it's 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 kind of like a, a big a big answer. You know, you've got to have the right the right DNA as a founding team and you've got to you've got to be operating operating in the right market at the right time. Yeah, I I think that often there's kind of this misnomer of it's all about the idea. An idea is like mm -hmm. maybe one percent of the thing, whereas team and timing and market and luck and there are just so many other factors that go into it that I appreciate you kind of highlighting those as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe to kind of look at the other side of the coin, maybe it's the same answer. But how would you answer that question for what makes a good startup to invest in? Yeah. Um, so, you know, from an investor's perspective, right, there has to be the ability for venture scale returns, right? And what that means is, no, it's not so much the case for 43 North because we're not structured as a fund, but I think the same principles apply, right? Because we don't have like your typical limited partner structure. Uh, our funding comes through the state of New York, um, but we still look for companies that can achieve venture scale because that also aligns us with, you know, other co-investors and downstream investors. But what that fundamentally means is that, you know, we have return um, objectives 
objectives or return targets uh, that have to be in excess of certain benchmarks, right? And so kind of crude example or basic example, you've got a hundred million dollar fund, you're looking to three X that fund, um, you know, which is, which is a $300 million return back to your limited partners. Well, understanding that venture is a, a power law type of business where, you know, a handful of deals are really going to re return the, the profits. I think, uh, there was a metric from, um, one of the large kind of institutional uh, LPs and, and the name's escaping me, but it's like 5% of all deals return, you know, 60% or 5% of deals return 60% of all uh, profits. And so understanding that a lot of your investments are going to go to zero uh, or maybe break even, you know, every single deal has to have the ability to return your fund. Um, and so... I say all that to suggest you don't necessarily know which deals are going to produce those outside outsized returns, but the founders, the founding team, when they're pitching you, they have to present a vision. There has to have, there has to be the ability to return it or some, you know, vision for producing those returns so that you are very much aligned from the outset, you know? And so if a founder is coming in and they're, their exit scenario or or exit planning is, hey, you know, we're looking to, you know, sell this company in three years for fifty million dollars, right? Depending on the fund or the investor, that's not really going to be. It, it sounds like a great outcome. It is a great outcome. Uh, those founders can make a lot of money, uh, but for a venture investor, you know, that's not going to produce a meaningful enough outcome, and so. Um, being aligned in the the outcomes the founders and the investors are seeking has to be like that's that's paramount, um, and I think kind of within that framework there has to be something very unique about the idea about the business. Um, you know, it's a it's a non consensus game, and so you've got to have an open mind as an investor to you know uh, very unique, novel ideas, um, because that's really the only way to to, to generate alpha. So, um, you know, what is the the comparative comparative advantage and, and durability of this company, uh, and how can they really compound that over time? Um, because if it proves itself to be a good idea, there's going to be competitors that flood the space, right? And so they, they, you got to you got to have the ability to either kind of be first and and expand rapidly, or build some you know moats around your business to really fend off the competition that's going to flood the space if you prove to be successful. So um, you know that's kind of the the. You know, basic analysis that that we do in terms of what makes a good venture investment. Yeah, it's interesting to kind of hear the the granularity. I think deal sizing and just you know breadth of problem, how big the problem is, what's the mm -hmm. potential total addressable market. You know, all these things that entrepreneurs like maybe a little begrudgingly like build the slides and build the decks and answer these mm -hmm. questions. There's a reason for it because there needs to be alignment of capital coming in as well as alignment of the founders. And we're all marching in the same direction. Yeah. For, yeah. for, for that kind of uh, that deal box that you're defining of making sure that, you know, the founder, the company has that defensibility or has that unique moat. Is there, I mean, what you're kind of describing is like no two deals are like there, there needs to be a unique aspect. You need to have that open mind from one company to the next. How much is the investing process just like, check these boxes and then art form or is it all art form or is it more of like, okay, well, here's the rubric and like we generally stick to this and then we just need to see like one unique aspect for defensibility or for scale or a unique selling proposition that, that says like why these, this team and this founder. Yeah, it's, that's a great question. I mean, it is very much, um, I wouldn't necessarily necessarily say equal parts, uh, kind of science and art, but I think there is, um, there's kind of the discipline and having your framework. I think it's important to have a, uh, an investing framework. Now that may differ from, you know, investor to investor. And so that's something to keep in mind, 
right? Uh, you know, some investors are willing to underwrite different risks uh, at kind of different risk uh, profiles than than others. Um, but then there there very much is an art to it, and that, that that subjective nature of investing is is very difficult, right? Especially at the earliest stages. You know, if you're talking to, to later stage investors, it, it very much becomes more like financial engineering. And, and there's certainly some art to that, but it's it's less, you know, investing in the um, the potential or the promise and more around the, the performance and, and, you know, what, you know, tangible traction you can see and model out. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the subjective nature is... Um, it's 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 just getting comfortable with you've got to build conviction in the vision that they're presenting in the founders in their ability to pivot if need be um you know so there are certain boxes we're looking to check but i think within that you have to understand maybe some of those things change right depending on the stage you're investing in if you're coming in at really like a a pre-seed or seed stage, um, you know, I think a, a mistake, um, you know, folks make is, is they're trying to like, they get hung up in like evaluating the business for what performance they're demonstrating today and not what performance, you know, they can potentially realize in the future. Right. And so it's not so much investing it in a company for what it is today, but what it can be, you know, tomorrow and next year. And so, um, you know, what's the, what's the team's ability to execute, you know, on that plan. And so there are certain boxes we're looking to check. Um, but then, you know, the rest of it is really the, the, the conviction you can build in the team, in the market opportunity. I think another area, right. Where, you know, maybe founders, um, and there's no right or wrong answer here, but like, you know, so often they're told, you know, your cam has to be this massive number and that's not wrong right like you have to you know if it's a large market you've you've got to be able to carve out you know a, a slice of that um but the flip side is you know emerging markets right you know markets that don't exist today that can become you know a massive market opportunity um and so it's it's not so much just kind of like the large fragmented markets it's you know what are what are the new emerging categories that haven't yet been defined and how can you come in and really um you know provide the catalyst within that you know emerging category with your product uh and really teach consumers how to think about it right um you know solving a problem that doesn't necessarily exist today but you think is going to exist you know in the future um and building for that future so it, it is a very subjective, I think, at the earliest stages uh, exercise, but um, that's what that's what makes it tough. Uh, if it was if it was obvious, there'd be no alpha in it, right? Um, so, yeah, I I think that uh, it's always been a fascinating process to understand well why this one and why not that one, and then maybe reflecting on your decision making process to try to make a more aligned algorithm, you know, process, you know, deal flow, deal machine, how you evaluate to try to standardize, but also recognize that you, you will never be able to standardize it because no two deals are like, yeah. yeah I you think on that point, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, if I just interrupt real quick, because you said something that's super interesting just around, um, you know, how you, you know, you know, why one deal and wh why not another deal? I think an important, um, an important exercise for really like the, the postmortem on any deal is, is documenting your process in real time, right? Writing those deal memos, you know, why you invested in that deal and why you didn't invest in another deal and tracking the deals you don't invest in. And if you, you know, your if your anti portfolio proves to like if if there are deals you missed that you for whatever reason didn't didn't make, um, you know, being able to reflect back on your thoughts from that moment versus trying to um, trying to you know reflect back uh, 
without having anything tangible that you documented in real time. Cause then that leads to, um, there, there's some cognitive biases that will, you won't have sound judgment. Right. And so the like, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. Well, you have to be able to reflect back on that and know what was, what was your thought process in the moment. And so that's just, you got to have shots on goal. Um, but you have to be documenting the process all along the way. So, you know, what kind of that prior, you know, version of yourself or, you know, what your thought process was. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's probably sound advice, not just for the investor, but also the entrepreneur and also anyone to, if you're able to kind of have snapshots of your state of mind, why you did certain things at that time, it can help you reflect more accurately versus the cognitive biases that you're talking about, about, you know, well, when I reflect on this now and the things I know now, it's hard to not kind of distort your memory or distort your, your opinion of your past self one way or another, which is, you know, anti, anti true, if you will, towards being able to figure out the best path forward. Yep. You touched on emerging markets. Is AI overhyped or underhyped or is open AI just going to eat all these little startups up and put them out of business with more feature releases. Yeah. Well, talk about uh, <laughs> open AI, right? A uh, pertinent subject, uh, given the <laughs> events of the weekend, you know, we're recording this on a Tuesday morning. Uh, and if anyone was tracking that, uh, all Sam's weekend. back, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. What a, <laughs> what a, I'm waiting for the Netflix, you know, documentary, documentary to drop because they just somehow always have the inside scoop. Um, you know, I don't, I don't proclaim to, to, you know, be an expert within AI. I think, um, you know, is it overhyped? Is it underhyped? You know, I think, I think AI as a category is, I think, properly hyped. Uh, you know, I think it, it really is, um, it's going to change how we do everything. It already is changing how we do everything. It's, I think, analogous to the internet in a way, uh, in terms of that technology inflection. Um, I think as an investor, you know, and through that lens, there is a lot of money, there's a lot of capital that is going to be incinerated investing in AI. And right. So I think a lot of, I think there's going to be a lot of value that accrues to incumbents, uh, like your, you know, Microsoft, like who invested in open AI. Um, because I think some of the applications are, are features more than they are standalone businesses that have a durable, uh, competitive adva advantage, right. Going back to the conversation around moats, um, there's also, all, you know, it can be a, a very capital intensive business. Um, but I think, you know, there are going to be massive businesses that are going to be built, you know, on top of, you know, AI. Um, and so I think there are a lot of companies, if you look at some of the largest companies today, you know, in the space, right to open AI, for example, you know, that, that, that company was founded in 2016, 15, 20, I think, yeah. 2015, like 2016. Right. So, you know, what was the hot category, you know, in 2015, it wasn't AI. Right. And so like VR and, and, uh, I forget what, right. Else. Yeah. Right. So what, you know, what the wise do early, the fools kind of do late. I think right now there's, there's a lot of money chasing, you know, you always want to be kind of early to these cycles. Now, I think we still are early in the, in the larger cycle that is AI, but I think at least for myself, like I feel very uncomfortable, like evaluating a lot of AI deals because it just feels like the pace of innovation renders them, um, you know, uh, just out of date, you know, in the next six to 12 months. Right. And so I just think there's a lot of companies that feel like more of like a feature or a wrapper on top of, you know, these open AI models. 
than it is a standalone business. But I'm excited to see what businesses are built and continue to be built. Um, so I, I would say it's properly hyped. I don't necessarily think it's overhyped, but I do think there's a lot of capital that is going into deals that just aren't great deals at valuations that are way too high, way too high. Uh, and that's not a way to make money. Um, you know, $100 million seed rounds. Like it's, it, that, it's just not a way to make money. Setting I don't up believe. For, for failure and down rounds down the road. Yep. I like the idea. I think there's a lot of truth in, in what you're saying. Of We're seeing features. They're not necessarily standalone companies. They're not necessarily investable. But I, I also think that there's truth to the, the, the original cycle started in you know, 2015. Or I mean, if you look at machine learning, it's, it's kind of been here for you know, five, 10 years or something like that. And only with like transformers in, in the past, I guess, I was that 2018 or something? I don't quite know when that was. But we've started to kind of see the advent and the birth of these foundational models, these large language models that are what's driving this massive change over the past year. That's kind of the first cycle, right? And you mentioned being early, especially being an investor, you want to look at companies that are going to have, maybe they're doing something a little bit differently or they have a different approach or they have a different moat. At what point, what are you looking for as, as markers or indicators that maybe we've entered phase two, maybe the things that companies are starting to come up with are actually companies, not just features. They're not just going to be gobbled up by open AI. How do you get early on this second round of innovation, the second round of, of companies? And again, if you look at the internet, right, maybe the first internet opportunity was like investing in, I don't know, servers and nodes or something. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Right. So maybe the first wave was servers. The second wave then was like, um, you know, infrastructure for doing like payments online or marketplaces with Mar eBay or yeah. Amazon. Right. So how do you find kind of like the defensible, resilient second wave and second order effects coming from AI? And when will you know, OK, well, now I want to start writing checks for AI companies because they're the, the ecosystem is not shifting every three weeks with a new startup, a new release, a new feature, a new company. <laughs> that's the, that's the billion dollar question. You know, I don't, I don't know if I've got a great answer for you. Right. But I, I do like the analogy to the early days of the internet, right. Kind of investing in the, in the, in the atoms, right. Early versus kind of the bits, uh, when you, you know, you had your, your Ebays come online, your Yahoo's, uh, your Google's. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's that question, you know, is something that, that we discuss, but I don't, I don't know if I've got a good answer for you. You know, I think it's keeping an open mind. And when that opportunity comes along, recognizing it as fundamentally different. And I just, I haven't seen enough deals where I feel like that shift has happened. Um, so I don't, yeah, it, it's a great question and I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for you, to be honest. We'll chalk it up to the, uh, the art side of the deal flow and then also it the is. experience side. I mean, it's so nascent and so early. I, I also yeah. appreciate the, if you don't have a good answer, you know, that's, that's your answer. That's, yeah. that's I mean, but I think that's, that that's one of the difference too, right? You know, it's the entrepreneur that that has the 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 you know you're you're underwriting the entrepreneur who who comes to you with that idea, right? If you know, if I had a very clear answer, then maybe I should be, you know, starting the company and not funding it, right? So, but I think it's the ability to recognize a fundamentally different idea and having the temperament to underwrite deals that are maybe non-consensus, right? Like as an investor. OpenAI comes along, uh, or a hugging face, or you know some of these other you know iconic AI companies that have started you know much earlier than, than what you're seeing now. You know you had to be willing to step away from kind of the herd mentality. I think to, you know to your point, I don't know if, if it was the category that was hot, but like let's say it was AR VR in 2015, 2016. Um, you know, where you've got a large provision of capital that's chasing those deals, you know, having the temperament to say, hey, I'm going to underwrite this AI deal. Um, you know, the benefit is you're going to get in at a lower entry price. 
uh, which, you know, those lower entry prices don't exist anymore. And so, you know, I think now, right, what's that second phase? Well, again, it's kind of diverging from the, the path most traveled, uh, where kind of a large provision of capital is going in and saying, hey, here's kind of like a fundamentally different, you know, application uh, or technology. And you've got the temperament to say, hey, we're going to we're going to underwrite this deal. I don't know what that looks like today, um, but I'm excited to see when those start coming across my desk. You touch a little bit on how 43 North is different than traditional venture, not having LPs. Why don't you kind of break down what that structure is, what 43 North is and, and how you guys operate? Yeah, so we are we are structured as a 501c3. Uh, we do have, um, you know, uh, there's an associated foundation, right? So when we invest in deals, well, let me take you back to the beginning, right? So we we were launched in 2014, uh, really as a as a vehicle for economic development in the region. Um, you know, saying, hey, Buffalo is this um, kind of emerging city. Uh, you know, it was one of the iconic cities back in the um, kind of pre uh, you know, World War II, you know, it was, it was a boom town. It was, I think, I think at the time it was, it had like the sixth highest concentration of millionaires, right? You had the Erie Canal, you had the Great Lakes, just industry was booming. And then, you know, we, as a society really moved away from that, you know, manufacturing was outsourced, um, you know, overseas and, and, and so, you know, you've got kind of traditional economic development tools, uh, you know, at your disposal, but that's very much focused on kind of the here and now and getting companies that are, you know, much larger to uh, potentially relocate and offering incentives to do so. But, um, you know, credit, you know, our stakeholders, our, you know, uh, you know, founding uh, board members for having the vision to say, you know, we've got to invest in, in the future. And that's, you know, seeding early stage startups that are creating that future. And so, um, you know, we had some early support from our stakeholders to really test this hypothesis uh, in 2014. And now, you know, nine years later, um, we're on our ninth cohort. We've invested in 64 deals. You know, we had, uh, you know, one company go public, ACV Auctions, which was a part of our second cohort in 2015. Um, you know, at a, at a, I think it was a 3.85, um, billion dollar, uh, they were, their, their market cap at IPO was 3.85 billion. They employed 2000 people over 2000 people, you know, across North America, uh, with, you know, a little over a thousand employees, you know, right here in Buffalo. Um, and so, you know, our companies have, have gone on to, to, to attract, you know, just north of a billion dollars in venture funding. But the way we're structured, right, so we're funded by the state, we're, we're state funded, but we're, we're not state operated. There's kind of a separation of powers there. We, we do have an independent uh, board. Um, the way we invest is, uh, and we've done so since the very beginning, we deploy $5 million annually. Um, in the early days, our strategy was much more kind of larger cohorts, smaller average check. It was actually kind of tiered. There was like a million dollar winner, right? Uh, and then a, a series of, it was, you know, $500,000, $250,000 checks. It was, it was tiered. Starting last year, we said, hey, let's take a more concentrated approach. And instead of, you know, investing in 10 deals at, you know, different deal sizes, let's go five investments, million dollars a piece for 5% equity. And the instrument that we use is, um, is warrant the company's issue 43 North, uh, a warrant, 5% coverage. There's some automatic, there's an automatic, uh, trigger for, for convert, converting that warrant. Uh, and when that warrant is converted into, into shares, uh, we have uh, a foundation that becomes the shareholder and then any, any, um, you know, exit profits are, are distributed to, to the foundation. And that's really, you know, our vehicle for being self, uh, sustaining, right. Cause this was never intended to be something that, that lived forever. It was, you know, 
building a, a, a successful, you know, having a successful track record and, um, and turning that into, to, to a self-sustaining vehicle. So that's the way we're, we're, we're structured and, and how we operate and a little bit of the history. Yeah. I appreciate that. Are you still state funded or with returns? Are you now able to operate out of the, 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 you know, returns into that foundation? And if not, what's the timeline plan to, to get to self-sustaining? Yeah. I mean, we, again, you know, we were, we're, uh, pretty liquid with, uh, what's in the foundation, right. From the, from the, the IPO and, and some other, uh, exits that have occurred. Uh, we still are state funded, um, and very much value that partnership with, with ESD. And so there is, uh, some internal timelines, um, you know, and eventually there'll be some announcements that are, that are made in, in terms of the, the go for plan, but, but we still, uh, we still are, are state funded, um, and yeah, that's, that's what I'll say about that. In terms of the, I'd love to kind of pick apart the, the thought process behind why 5%, you know, at, so basically a $20 million valuation, if you're doing $1 million checks now, does that preclude you from certain deals because you need them to kind of be at that valuation? Um, and then maybe if I keep tacking more things on there, like why structure it as a warrant versus a convertible note, kind of pros, cons mm -hmm. there. So would just love to kind of understand a little bit more about the, the whys behind the specific structure. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we really, so it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, you know, what, what instrument is, is kind of the, 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 the best instrument to use. I think there's pros and cons to all. Uh, I mean, there's, there's definitely cons to investing in a convertible note. I think the warrant gives us a little bit more flexibility. It allows us to get into deals we otherwise wouldn't get into. Um, you know, the 5% infers a valuation of 20 million. Um, but we're not necessarily looking at deals, um, you know, at that price. So, and, and you can go on our website and see this. If you look at the, uh, it's all, it's all public, right? The, um, the conversion trigger for the warrant agreement is, um, when a company raises a at least $3 million priced round at at least a $10 million pre-money valuation, right? So that warrant converts um, at a $13 million post, 4 or 5%, right? If it were a save for a convertible note and you know $20 million was the valuation cap and a company was raising a price round at a $13 million post, you know, I don't know the math in my head, but we would be converting at a higher equity percentage. And so obviously that's not like the best thing for us, but it's a great thing for the company. Um, you know, we're offering very generous, generous deal terms in, in that regard. And so, um, you know, we, we do have in terms of the, the entry prices that we're, that we consider, like we, we have some pretty rigid investment criteria now we're not necessarily dogmatic about that because you have to you know recognize good opportunities when they when they come across your desk and they may not necessarily fit the profile you're looking for um, but we've invested in deals that you know are closer to that 20 million dollar valuation and we've invested in deals that um you know are much at a much lower entry price i think the warrant gives us some flexibility it is non-standard Right, it's just not generally a, an instrument that you see used a lot. But I do think, you know, some of the genius behind it was that it gave us it gave us a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, early on, I think it still does, and because we don't necessarily have uh, certain return targets. Like, if you look at a Venn diagram, like economic development in one circle and venture in the other circle, like forty three North is somewhere in the middle. And so part of why we're able to offer such generous, you know, deal terms is that um, we don't have the the strict return targets of that kind of pure VC uh, category. So that's a, it's a little bit of the why, um, but it's it's always a constant kind of discussion around is that the right is it the right instrument to be investing you know on is it the right deal terms. 
Um, but it's, it's, it's proven to be a very successful structure for us. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've raised capitals for several companies before. I've also just looked at a lot of different terms and how to price it and all this kind of, stuff. I mean, the terms that you guys are offering are fantastic for the founder and it, and it's rare that you see that. Um, but it's pretty cool and it makes sense because if, if, you know, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome with VC, the incentives are profit. Like the, the only reason a VC invests in you is because they want to make an outsized return for their LPs and then their two and 20 carry. When you blend and kind of tease apart that, that incentive and you say, okay, yeah, we want to be self-sustaining. Yeah. We want to make money. Yeah. We want to grow the fund, but we also are focused on economic development. Then you can kind of say, oh, well, that makes sense. That's why this is more favorable. That's why maybe this is actually better for me as the founder and the entrepreneur because their incentives are not just push me to sell, push me for liquidity, push me for, you know, either burnout and, and fail, not like emotionally burnout, but like, you know, flame out and, and crash and burn inside of three to five years or be a rocket ship in IPO in, in, in five to 10 years and, and kind of get those returns and the benchmarks and the timeline that you need for the fund. You have a broader thesis, you have a broader mandate, which means that you can be more flexible and open to long-term value creation for the entrepreneur, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's less friction for us, right? From the economic development side, right? We require a condition of that investment is that companies relocate to Buffalo for our program, right? Our accelerator runs for a year. Companies, we make selections in October uh, and then, you know, companies um, come to Buffalo in January, right? The, the program runs, you know, for the full calendar year, January through December. And, you know, we require all key officers and the majority of the team to relocate, right? So, um, you know, you, you want to you wanna create a, a favorable environment for deal making um, and you want to incent those companies to relocate uh, and to participate in the program. And then obviously your hit rate's not going to be a hundred percent on those deals. I think our retention rate is about 58%, but, um, you know, and, and there's other reasons, right. Beyond the capital, why they, why they want to be here, why they want to participate in this program. And that's part of, uh, you know, how we diligence those companies, but you know, to your point, right. We we're able to offer some favorable deal terms, uh, because of our structure, because of, you know, um, our mission. And I think it, it, you know, benefits really all parties. That's a piece that we haven't actually touched on too much, which is the fact that you are an accelerator program in addition to kind of writing those checks. When is it value additive for a founder and a startup to go through an accelerator program? Versus when would you say, hey, maybe it doesn't make sense. Sure, I understand that you want the capital or you're trying to raise, but accelerated program, not for you, doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you are a, I'll try not to paint with like broad strokes here. You know, our, I'll take a step back. Like our program, I think fundamentally attracts like a more mature company. It's not so much that, Kind of three month like intensive program where you're gonna you're gonna learn um you know a lot of different concepts around like how to go from kind of concept or mvp to um kind of this operational pre-seed seed stage business um and you know it's it's curriculum heavy you know mentorship heavy uh for that three months like we're a year-long program we're much more like operationally hands-on you know, we view ourselves very much as like an extension of their team. We've got different functions across our team. And so I, I lead our portfolio function, which is, um, you know, the pre-investment, you know, deal sourcing diligence selection, which is headed by our, our director of selection, uh, CJ Carr. And then we've got uh, our platform function, which is the post-investment program support, alumni support, uh, headed by our senior platform manager, Cindy Sideris. And then we have an investor relations, um, you know, manager on our team, Arden Sorge, who uh, helps, you know, both from a, a deal sourcing perspective, but but obviously a fundraising support perspective. And then across the rest of the team, there's a marketing function, 
Um, there is a, a talent and recruiting function. And so, you know, in addition to the financial capital, there's, there's the um, kind of reputational capital, human capital that we can really marshal for those companies. And so the benefit of a year long program is that we get to understand those businesses at a, at a, at a deeper level than you can in a three month program and be an extension of their team and a force multiplier in a lot of different ways. And so we're, we're not like this curriculum heavy accelerator program. We do have kind of those workshops, uh, those fireside chats. Mentorship is a big component of what we do uh, and what we offer. Uh, but really what you're going to get is a team that's going to be a, a, a force multiplier to help you go from really seed to series A. And so to your original question, you know, what companies are suited for an accelerator or what companies aren't? I think if you have, um, you know, a team that has, 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 you know, maybe they're on their second startup, right? They're a multi-time founder. They don't necessarily need an accelerator program. I think they're probably going to be able to raise capital from your your kind of traditional uh, investors. Um, I don't think they necessarily need it. Um, you know, or if you've, you know, participated in a lot of accelerators, right? I think one of the things we look at is like, if you've been in kind of two to three accelerators before 43 The, the North, serial accelerator yeah, program it, attendee. <laughs> there's just something that's, that's not clicking, right? Um, and so... We have a lot of uh, a lot of our portfolio companies are alum of TechStars, YC, um, you know, Mass Challenge, et cetera. Um, but you know, we're not necessarily. I think it's 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 a red flag if you've been in you know kind of more than one accelerator before Forty Three North. Because again, we are we are different uh, than our, our our peers in kind of the 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 size of the check, the duration of the program, and I think what we offer relative to what, um, you know, other programs offer. Um, because again, we're, we're, we're more kind of operationally driven. And so there's, there's, there's gotta be some momentum and, and things working for those companies. But, um, yeah, I would say if you, if you've been in a lot of programs before, it's probably, you know, there's probably something broken. Um, or if you've, been around the block and you know this isn't your first rodeo and and you know you don't necessarily need that that level of support um then you know capital's commodity i'm sure you can go get it from any other investor right so makes sense appreciate the breakdown Maybe to close us out, let's let's zoom out macro. You're obviously seeing a lot of deal flow. I'm sure you're seeing a lot of AI. We already touched on that. What macro trends are interesting to you as of right now? Or do you really take it on a deal by deal basis? Yeah, I mean, we take it very much on a deal by deal basis. Um, we are an industry agnostic program. Uh, we got, you know, this year we had 951 applications from 49 states and 42 countries. And so um, it's the, the breadth of deals that we see is pretty extensive. And so, um, you know, we try to have a point of view on a lot of different industries, but we also need to recognize where we can provide, you know, outsized value. And that's not necessarily across all industries. Um, but we, we take it on a, a, a deal by deal basis. We saw a lot of AI companies. We didn't actually invest in any kind of pure AI companies, um, you know, for our, our year nine cohort, which is, you know, again, take that for what it's worth. Right. Um, we saw a lot of AI deals, but, but didn't necessarily, um, we actually considered a few very, very strongly, but, you know, ultimately they, they didn't make it through, but, you know, we'll, we'll invest in anything, you know, CPG, digital health, um, you know, advanced manufacturing, uh, you know, we'll consider hardware, software, you know, enterprise consumer. Um, and so, yeah, I think AI will continue to be a very interesting space that we'll, we'll, we'll monitor and look at. And, you know, to your earlier question around like, what does the second phase of that look like? Um, you know, I'm interested to see where, where that goes like over the next year, right? Cause we're, we're already starts, we're already starting the, the deal sourcing process, you know, for, for our, our 10th cohort next year, right? Like you never turn that off, obviously. Um, so 
yeah, I think there's going to be, there's a lot of things to monitor uh, and it'll be, it'll be an exciting year for sure. Exciting times we're living in. Dom, if people want to find out more about 43 North, you follow, apply, anything, uh, where should they go? How should they find you and connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. Go to 43north.org. Uh, we do have a waiting list if people want to jump on there. Um, you know, all of our socials at 43 North. Um, if you want to follow me at Costanzo DR, or you can just uh, shoot me an email, Dominic at 43north.org. Myself, um, any any member of our team would love to, to chat with you, talk with you. So drop us a line, follow us on social. Uh, and if you want more information, just head over to 43north.org. Thanks for coming on the show, Don. Appreciate it, Elijah.